someone asked me <laughs> recently, you know, if you thought about like uh, some intro music to the Robcast. So, Preston, can you give me some intro music? <laughs> That's my son Preston, and uh, my desk where I work and record the Robcast is this back house room where we keep drums and bass and guitars, and it's where Preston's bedroom is, and we have surfboards, and it's it's our like it's our space, right? So, um, but let's get something, let's get something dirtier, something heavier, something like with some, you know. <laughs> Wait, can we have some Slayer? Can we have some Slayer to intro things? <laughs> can I have some Cure? So there, there is some intro music for the Robcast. Are you happy? Thank you, Preston. Are you going to band practice now? Yeah. All right, so Preston's going to band practice. You have just had some intro music. We all feel a little better. Welcome to the Robcast. Uh, this one's called Good Versus Perfect. And I have one very simple idea I want to share with you on the difference between good and perfect. Uh, good comes to us from the Hebrews. Perfect comes to us from the Greeks. And uh, I, wanna, I wanna give you a very simple way of seeing good and perfect. Um, I wanna actually oversimplify because it's really helped me make sense of some things. Uh, but before we do that, uh, my word, so much going on. This past week, uh, we did two-day event at the Viper Room, and then this next week we're doing a two-day event at the Viper Room, and then the following week. And uh, there was this moment, last week's event was for uh, people who communicate, artists, it was about the creative process, writers, anybody who makes things, essentially. And there was this moment where this uh, guy had a question, and he, he talked about how he was a, he's, an, he's a painter, he's an artist. And... He, was, uh, he had a specific question, but then he mentioned that his dad is also an artist. And he said, actually, my dad is here. And his dad was sitting next to him. And he was like, yeah, my dad gave me for Christmas, um, he gave me a ticket so that he and I could come to this event together. And then the dad said, I got something I want to say. And he's just this great sort of peaceful, uh, it was like the village elder spoke. Do you know what I mean? It's like the dad said, I'd like, got something I'd like to say. And he talked to the group about how when he was a young artist starting out and he had a young family, he was endlessly torn between... Bye, Preston. See you later, bud. He said he was endlessly torn between the demands of the art that he was creating and his family and his obligations to his wife and kids. And he said that uh, one time he had made a huge bonfire in the backyard because he was trying to get some burned wood for this project he was working on and his son came home with his two friends and his son was really young and his son walks into the backyard with his two friends and his dad in the middle of the day is making this huge bonfire and his son turns to his other friends and said ah that's art uh, and it's just a great story but he said he was always struggling with I, I need to give my art more um, but I also have my family and I, and I love being with them and I have my responsibilities to my wife and kids and then he got like a little sort of uh, emotional, and he just said, but then my son turned out to be this amazing artist. And all that time that I was worrying if I would have known that my son uh, was going to turn out like this, I, I wouldn't have kept it, because what he's done and created has been so meaningful. And it was just like one of those 
it was just one of those moments where everybody, we're all just figuring it out, right? And whatever it is you're currently stressed about, at some point you're going to look back and be like, remember when I used to be stressed about that? Or whatever it is that's got you down, it's got you in the middle of the night laying awake, unable to sleep, like a weight on your chest, whatever it is, at some point you'll have more insight on it. You'll have more wisdom on, on it. At some point you may even be like, remember when I used to be concerned about that? And you'll laugh about it. Uh, it was just amazing. And uh, then uh, also last week I told you about my new book, which is coming out. The book is called How to Be Here. It's all about being fully present in your life not just like sitting on a cushion or on top of a mountain or meditating, but it's more about how do you stay present when your day is taking the kids to school and doing laundry and going to meetings and returning emails and getting stuck in traffic and stopping by the UPS store. You know that? You know what I'm talking about? It's not, it's not a book about detachment from the world. It's a book about how do you stay present so you don't miss a thing, so you don't feel like your life is passing you by. Because for so many people, it feels like they're skimming the surface of their own existence. So the book is about how to be present and in the now when you're actually in the hustle and the strain and the push and pull of everyday life. And I'm so excited for you to read it. Um, you can get... Uh, a pre, you can pre-order a copy and get a signed copy. I signed like a, a limited first edition series, and you can get those at Barnes & Noble, bnn.com. And uh, then we're going to go out on tour starting in March. Uh, I, I believe the first leg is 10 cities, because I was thinking, what would be the best way? Because I want to come talk to you all, but not just give a, you know, a talk. I want to like hear what you have to say in, in your questions, and I want to interact like really close. So we've rented art galleries and... Uh, like meeting spaces and event spaces all around the country. Um, I think the first leg is 10 cities. Then I think we're going to take it overseas. And then we're looking at doing a, another leg in the fall of um, cities that we didn't go to in the spring. And we're so we've rented these spaces. We're going to do it in the round with chairs on a flat floor. And then I'm just going to walk in among the chairs the whole time. So we're going to be like, we're gonna be we're gonna be hanging out, and then I started thinking I want to make sure as many people as possible could come, and I know a lot of people work during the week, obviously. So the events are on Saturdays, and then we started looking at cities and thinking if you drew a circle, how far could someone come and not need to get a hotel room? So it'll start at Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. to give people a couple of hours. If you're coming from, you know, a couple hours away, you can still get there easy on a Saturday morning. We'll go all day Saturday, 10 to 6, and I'm telling you, it's gonna be so. Oh my goodness, I'm so looking forward to it. So uh, you can see at robbell.com the sites, you can get your tickets for the Saturday event and I'll be essentially taking the book and then launching it farther. So um, the book is sort of begins a bunch of discussions but then we gotta take it farther and we gotta find out how you're reacting to it. And so I know exactly what I'm gonna talk about but then I also know that many of you will raise your hand, you'll say, but what about whatever? And then we'll surf that wave for a while. So. Oh, my word. So exciting. And then if you're in L.A., um, Pete Holmes and I, the, the legendary comic, world-renowned comic, Pete Holmes and I, we created a two-man show last year called Together at Last, and we toured it around the country a bit, and now we have a new show we're doing, and we are going to do it this Wednesday at Largo here in L.A., and if you're around, I'm telling you, good times. And then I'm coming to Australia in a couple of weeks, and uh, Sydney, January 29th, and then uh, Melbourne, February 1st. In Sydney, I'll be at Seymour Center, York Theater, and I'll be at the Athenium, is that how you say it? In Melbourne, and you can get tickets at those venues, and it's my first time going to Australia, and uh, we're gonna blow the roof off, I'm telling you right now. I'm coming your way, friends, down under. Now, uh, that we have done music. We've had a little Slayer to kick things off. So we had some Black Sabbath in there. We had some Cure. Uh, I think that one riff was a riff Preston wrote. So we've got like some opening music and uh, we've got a little uh, Viper Room story and we talked about the book. Now let's talk about good versus perfect. And, and uh, this is very personal to me, good versus perfect. And I want you to see good versus perfect as two different ways, almost like two s different spiritual lenses through which you view the world. Two ways of seeing your life in the world. 
Um, so I want to talk about how you see things. I want to talk about how that reflects how we view the nature of the world. I want to make a slight com uh, sort of a side comment about the afterlife. And then I want to talk specifically about the voices in our head that tell us who we are and what we're doing here and what's right with us and what's wrong with us. Um, so let's, let's use perfect and good as two very generalized, over, oversimplified way of seeing things. And so the first, let me just say, sometimes perfect is the right word. Somebody says to you, oh man, you, you, that, that meal was perfect. Or they said just the perfect thing at that moment. I'm not talking about that kind of perfect. Um, I'm not talking the kind of the, the appropriate proper use of perfect, but I'm, I, I want to talk about the unhealth of certain notions of perfection and how the unhealth and the distorted and warped understandings of certain ways of understanding perfect and perfection can actually um, get in the way of our joy and our thriving in the world. So I want to start with this idea, this Hebrew word, good. The Bible begins with a poem. I'm sure you know that. The Bible doesn't begin with a science textbook. It begins with a poem. And the poem has a rhythm and a cadence to it. And in the poem, there are trees, and there's a sun, moon, and stars, and there are animals, and the God who's sort of the engine of this poem. It's a poem about the world. The God who's the catalyst, the engine, the spark that, that sustains the thing, that, that makes it flow. God keeps saying, it's good, it's good it's good. And then this appeared and it's good. And then this came and it's good. And then this was made and it's good. And so there are trees that with fruit and the fruit has seeds and it's good. And the seeds uh, are buried in the earth. And then those seeds grow up into new trees that create fruit and that fruit creates seeds. And then those seeds buried in the earth and so they're trees, but the trees are going to create something more, more trees. And so in the poem that begins the Bible, creation is endlessly moving forward. Things are here that make more, that make more, that make more. And by the way, for a seed to create new life, it first has to be buried. It has to go down into the earth. It has to have dirt piled on top of it. And it has to experience a darkness. We would say a sort of death. So for things to grow, there first and foremost has to be organically a death of sorts in which they're buried in the earth. And so death and birth are natural organic processes through which life comes into the world. Death and birth or rebirth are natural organic processes through which new life comes into the world. And then there's sun, moon, and stars, and God says they're good. But if there's sun, moon, and stars, if there's sun, the sun rises, but the sun also sets. So there's light, but then it's dark, and then it's light again because the sun rises, and then the sun sets, and it's dark again. And God says, that's good. The Hebrew word is tov, tob. So there's light and there's darkness. There's death and there's birth. There's burying in the earth and there's rising from the earth. And it's good. It's all good. And then because you have the sun and the moon and the stars and the planet and rotations and cycles, there are seasons. There are seasons when things grow and then the fall, they begin to die. And then the winter, they die out. And then in the spring, they burst forth into life. And then summer, you have harvest. And then fall, you have the beginnings of death all the way into death in the winter. And so the seasons with a gradual planting and harvesting an explosion of life followed by a gradual tapering off into a death and a stillness and a winter hibernation to be usurped essentially by a new spring. Seasons are good. It's good. It's good. And so the Hebrews gave us this idea of an affirmation of life in all of its death and rebirthness, in all of its darkness and light, in all of its 
seasons that come and go. go. It's cold and then it's warm. Have you ever seen a birth? Because in this poem, it speaks of the birth of animals being fruitful and multiplying, and then it speaks of humans being fruitful and multiplying. Have you ever seen a birth? Is there anything on earth that's less nice and neat and tidy? It, the one thing a birth is not is perfect. It's bloody. It's agony. She's grabbing him by the neck and saying, what did you do to me? Get this baby out of me. It is this beautiful, joyous explosion of new life into the world. And it's also bloody and dangerous and fragile. And sometimes it doesn't go well and the new life doesn't survive. And yet it's all part of life here in this place we call home. And so what the Hebrews gave us was this idea of tov, good. Good is sweaty and dirty and dark and light and death and birth and sexy and it's wine and it's food and it's friends and it's embraces. Tov is of the earth. Tov isn't interested in nice, neat, right angles. Tov isn't really interested in everything being spotless and shining and polished and glossed. Tov is about life in all of its bristling authenticity. Are you with me? So there is Tov, but then the Greeks, the Hebrews gave us this Tov, good. The Greeks gave us this idea of perfect. I'm sure other people gave it to us as well, but, but the Greeks gave us this idea of the ideal, the idea of perfect. So the Greeks had, you see the statues, the naked athlete, whose muscles are all toned perfectly on the cover of People magazine. Are you with me now? See, the Greeks gave us this idea of this ideal, this idea of striving to be the ultimate human. The Greeks gave us the Olympics. The Greeks gave us all sorts of extraordinary wisdom and writing and athletics and form and line and design and aesthetics. And we celebrate all of the goodness of this Greek ideal of humanity flourishing at its finest in harmony with all the elements. But the problem is all that good also has an unhealth to it, which is an ideal, a perfection and ideal that can never be meet, reached. It also brings with it sometimes uh, some baggage involving static categories of life. Here's what I mean. Tov, good, it's all good, has a dynamic built into it that life, the universe itself, the planet, you are in the endless process of becoming. There is a movement, a motion, a flow to good. Things are one day a certain way, but tomorrow they will not be the same way. That tree will keep growing. It will keep producing. That person will be moving forward or they will be moving backwards. That person will be growing and maturing and flourishing, or they won't. Life, um, think about the food that you bring home from the supermarket. The more life it has, the fresher it is, the closer it is from the source from which it came, the shorter its period within which it can give you life before it starts to go stale. The worst foods for you, like a Twinkie, you can leave in the cupboard for a year and nothing's going to happen to them. They're static, they're frozen, but life is changing, it's morphing, it's becoming. You are becoming somebody. Your energies and direction and trajectory and arc of your life are headed in a direction. The idea that we are static, frozen people simply isn't true because the universe itself is in the endless process of becoming. And oftentimes what happens with perfection, perfect, is it gives us a static view of the universe. You just are. You just arrive. How many people had a goal that they were like, when I reach that goal, then everything will be perfect. And you reach the goal and there was this profound letdown. You found yourself even bored because life is this dynamic reality that demands that we engage upon it. Sometimes perfection comes, or perfect, with it comes these categories. Basically, perfect is that which cannot be improved. But the moment there's nothing more to do, something within us is like, we, 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 it loses its vitality and heart. And so in some ways, good and perfect could be seen as a static, unchanging, fixed versus a dynamic, flowing, becoming views of the world. And good 
It's good. It's good. It's going somewhere. It's sweaty, dirty, sexy, wine and friends. It's stumbling down. It's falling flat on your face. See, the world, for the world to be a world, it has to actually be a world. This isn't for it not to be a stimulation, sim, a stimulation, for it not to be a stimulation, for it not to be a simulation, for, for it not to be uh, an intellectual exercise in the abstract, for the world to actually be a world. It has to be free to be a world. It has to be free to be bloody and dangerous, or it isn't a world. Do you see why this is so important? You have to be able to make a mess of things. If you don't have the kind of power that can really, really make a mess of things, then how could we ever have the kind of power and freedom and choice to make something really beautiful? See, for the world to be a world, it has to be free to be a world. And for you and I to be people, we actually have to be free to be people. For us to be human, we have to be free to be human. We have to have enough power and choice and will to make a complete mess of things, which means we have enough power and will and choice to create a new kind of world, a better kind of world, something beautiful. See, you as a human being, it's not about you running from that power from shrinking from it and avoiding it, which by the way, is most of the comments on YouTube and all that internet hate, all those people who seem to have tremendous energy to shred what other people are doing when they don't seem to be doing anything themselves. That's what happens when you shrink and run from the power that you have. As long as I'm pointing at the flaws of what somebody else is doing and making, then I don't have to deal with how I have been shrinking and running and avoiding my own power to do something in the world. People shrink and avoid that power because it's painful and bloody and frustrating. And so we're here, we're human beings, and we get to learn how to work in harmony with it taming it, moving in sync with it, finding its groove. See, the problem with perfect is when you have this ideal in your head of perfection is oftentimes perfect tries it. And if it doesn't immediately work out, perfect bails. Perfect is totally flummoxed. And I use that word flummoxed intentionally because it's a great word. You know what I'm talking about, right? You, you had this thing in your head, you tried it, immediately it didn't go how it was supposed to go or how you thought it was supposed to go or whatever the ideal was announced to you. And so what we do is just, ah, and so we just quit. I tried, but it wasn't awesome, so I quit. But Tov, good, understands that everything is in the process of becoming and things take time. Everything in your life that matters takes time and it takes intention and it takes energy and you wrestle with it and you dance with it and it knocks you down, but you get back up. See, it's all part of it when you're seeing life through the Tove good lens, the ebb and the flow and the seasons and the struggle. It's all part of what makes the world a world and all part of what makes you a human. It's all part of what makes you, you. Think about a sculptor working with clay. It's about the fingers digging into the clay and moving it around and trying this and that didn't work. So you go over here and you try this and then you try it that way and then maybe you add a little water and then you turn it around and you look at it from a different direction and then you, it's working with it. And all of the miscues, all of the things you tried that didn't work are all part of it. Here's the thing, good is okay with flaws. Good celebrates all those roads you went down that you found out were a cul-de-sac. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And you just found yourself turning round and round and round on that cul-de-sac and realized, wait, I gotta get back out of that street. It's the wrong street in the neighborhood to be in. Good celebrates all the misturns as part of it. See, perfect often doesn't know what to do with our humanity. Perfect endlessly flogs itself for its imperfections, for all the ways that it sees itself falling short of the ideal. But good sees that it's all part of the bloody, difficult, strange, exotic, mysterious, beautiful thing that we know to be life. Quick tangent, by the way, on afterlife. Somebody recently sent a, me a question and they said, can't we just skip through all of the difficulty of this life and the not knowing and get to the part where we die and then we know everything? <laughs> No, 
No, we can't. And here's why. First off, where did you get the idea that you'll die and then you know everything? That, you know what that is to me? That would be hell. If, if I die and then you know, and then all of a sudden I know everything, I would be in hell. Do you realize that the not knowing, the wonder and the mystery and the search and the exploration and the hunt and the discovery, that's where the life is. That's Tove. That's good. And for many people, the, the vision they were taught was essentially a very, essentially a very Greek afterlife. You're down here and you're just sort of screwing it all up. Notice the three-tiered language there. And then someday you die and then everything will be perfect. You, perfect. You mean that which can't be improved upon? You mean that which is static and unchanging? In other words, that which is so boring, you just want to die? Do you see how these ideas of good and perfect have so shaped the way we see everything, including how some people believe they'll die and then everything will get perfect. You don't want perfect, trust me. You want good. You want tov. You want process, becoming, exploration, learning. And, and by the way, oftentimes <laughs> the people who, ha who, who have that somewhere in, the, in their psyche, this idea that, well, then we'll die. You know, why can't we just skip to the end and then we die and we'll know everything? Well, in that case, if there is some sort of all-knowing being, you would be that being. And we don't necessarily find that vision very interesting of you being God. Um, nevertheless, we also, you love this sense that you don't know what today may bring. Your moments of greatest joy are when you actually have a sense of anticipation. Where is this going to go? You know that feeling when you go to see your favorite band and just before they come on, you're standing there and there's like this electricity in the room, like, oh my word, they're about to come out and something's going to happen. Or you go to dinner with your favorite friends and you're sitting there and you're three minutes early and you're at the table and you know they're going to show up and you know you're going to hug and you're going to order some good wine and then you're going to start talking and laughing and three hours later, you're still going to be there. It's that anticipation, that sense of... I don't exactly know what's going to come, but I know it's going to be good. Yeah. So, so let's disabuse ourselves of these ideas that somehow the goal is to get everything set and perfect, that which cannot be improved upon. Because that is the recipe for boredom. It doesn't mean that we seek, like, there are elements of excellence. There are elements of perfection that are very healthy and beautiful, which I said earlier, there are, there are obviously healthy sides of this, but I'm talking about the unhealthy side. And now let's shift to one last topic, the voices in your head. And here's where this has helped me so much. There are so many times I've said something and then later thought, what was I thinking? I wish I wouldn't have said that. There are times when I trusted somebody way too early and then I got burned and I was like, I could have gone way slower on that one. There are times when I made a move and then later was like, I cannot believe I made that move. And the problem for me is I'm beating myself up for why can't you just get everything right the first time? But then if you're like me, there's that second voice, right? That looks around and sees other people and says, why can't you be like so-and-so? They, they, just, they just skate, they float, they glide. And they just make one good decision after another. I mean, I look back on the past 15 years, and, <laughs> and if, what, what's it like? Sometimes it's felt like flying, but oftentimes it's felt like I was falling down a flight of stairs holding a stack of metal plates with a, <laughs> a, a chain strapped around my ankle. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And a toothbrush in my mouth. You know what I'm talking about? Um, what a weird image, by the way. Anybody have that feeling? Like there are, there are moments when, it, when everything was locked in and it was good and it was like, yes. But then there were so mo many moments when you felt like you just showed up. Um, it's like you showed up without taking a shower. Do you know that feeling where everybody else seems to be so clean and their outfits match, everything's perfect and you feel like you just showed up like you slept in your car? <laughs> Do you ever, you ever feel like you live your life showing up like you just slept in your car? It's like that feeling like you're a half step behind. Remember when, when in school, there were just kids who understood all the homework and just always were on it. And I was like, where's everybody getting this 
backstage access to all of the information where I always felt like I was a step behind. And you feel it in life. Certain people seem to financially, they just make one good decision after another. Uh, maybe it's for you, you've seen somebody in their career where they just, it just seems all up and to the right. And you're like, how come I take two steps forward and then three and a half back and then four? It just feels like fumbling in the dark. Please tell me there's somebody listening who relates to this. That's perfect. It's a voice in your head that tells you, you should nail this on the first try. And anything that isn't perfection out of the gate, there's something wrong with you. Anybody internalize some of those messages? But here's the thing. I get to interact with lots of people. I get to interview lots of people for the Robcast. I get to meet lots of people. And especially when I meet those people, or the people with perfect hair who seem to just make one decision after another, that's like, how, how did they get the secret pass to awesomeness that I didn't get? What's interesting when I ask them questions is they're figuring it out too. Really famous, rich, successful people, they're just figuring it out. And they have long lists of things they did wrong or things that they were like, and actually it's they did wrong, which is part of the problem. We'll get to that in a second. Everybody is at some level stumbling through it. Everybody is doing the best with what they got. And I know that's an incredible cliche, and it's because some cliches are a cliche is because they're true for a reason. See, Tov is good. It's about direction. It's about where you're headed. It's about your heart. Tov, good, has room for the flaws, for the missteps, because it's all part of it. See, the power of Tov and the power of Genesis chapter one, the first chapter in the Bible, is the, the light and the darkness both belong. The death and the burial and that new fresh seedling rising up out of the earth all belong. The season ending and a new season beginning, summer leading into winter, leading into fall, leading, wait, how's it go again? Summer <laughs> leading into fall, leading into winter when everything's dead and then the explosion of new life in spring is all part of it. Anybody here ever had a season end and you thought something was wrong with you? How come that friendship, I'm trying to keep that friendship alive. What's wrong with me that this friendship is ending? What's wrong with me that this job is ending? What's wrong with me that this thing that was once so great is now ending? It's a season. Sometimes the reason it's ending is because it's a season. And seasons come and season go. See, do you have a static, fixed view of the universe? A perfection-based view of the universe where everything is the way it is, you get it nailed, and then it stays exactly like that forever. That is not reflective of the world we live in. Tov acknowledges that there is a pain when one thing ends and another thing begins. When one thing runs its course, and then another thing starts. There is a pain of winter. Ever felt like it's winter, like a bunch of things died and it's really cold and lonely? Yeah. Tove, good, has room for that. And God said, it's good. It's good. It's all part of it. It's all part. I wish somebody would have, I'm like literally getting choked up thinking about this. I wish somebody would have told me this. I wish somebody would have said all of the ways you're going to fall flat on your face. All of the regrets, all the shame, all the humiliation, all the embarrassment, it's all part of you becoming you. So just stop taking it so hard on yourself. Stop beating yourself up. Stop flogging yourself for the ends of seasons, the beginning of seasons, for all the wrong turns. It's all good. It's good. It's good. Have you ever seen a birth? Oh my word. It's so scary, right? It's so great and everybody's like, but it's also terrifying. It's so bloody and dramatic and there's so much hanging in the balance and it's got so strong and life force pulsing through the delivery room, but it's also incredibly fragile because the whole thing could not work. Um, birth, man, it's, it's not perfect but it's good because it's all good.
It all belongs. That's not a cliche for a t-shirt. It is a truth about the whole, how the whole thing works. Anybody here been beating yourself up because your sister always gets better grades or your brother-in-law always makes more money or your neighbor always has perfect hair or your other neighbor seems to just skate by effortlessly? How does she do it? I don't know. But what I do know, what I do know is that good is how it works. Is there anybody here who you're trapped in the perfect, perfect mindset and you can't let yourself go and you need to move from perfect to good? It's where the joy is. You get knocked around, you pick yourself back up, you make a mistake, you make a blunder, you trust somebody, they stab you in the back, you lose a bunch of money, you spend money, and then later you're like, that was the dumbest thing to spend money on. <laughs> you launch a project and no one is interested. You schedule an event and no one comes. Yeah, you launch a business and no one wants your product. Yeah, 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 it's all part of it. It's all part of it. Anybody here been living with a perfect view and now we got to switch to a good view and you got to celebrate it and you got to take that thing and you, maybe you just write in big letters, T O V. It's all Tov. It's all good. The Hebrews gave us this gift of this idea. I wish somebody would have said to me years ago, oh, the Bible, what's the Bible? Oh yeah, the Bible's this fascinating story that begins with an affirmation of life in all of its bloody imperfections. <laughs> Wouldn't that have been great? It begins with this resounding, joyful embrace of all the messiness of life. All the times when seasons end. All the winters. All the changing of the tides. All of the terror and drama and fragility of birth. All of those moments when you feel buried in the dirt. And it turns out later that was simply the burial before the resurrection. If somebody would have said, this is a beautiful book that begins like that, with this giant, oh, how many people, by the way, religion basically gave them this whole category of perfection. You're supposed to be this, and if you're not, whoa, you're in trouble. And by the way, Jesus did say be perfect. There's some translations in English. I know some of you Bible heads are like, wait, 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 Jesus said to be perfect. No. That word in the Greek, it means more whole or mature. So when some translators translate Jesus saying, be perfect, I think he's saying, be whole, be mature. Pursue your health and wholeness. Line yourself up with the divine and how the divine moves through the world. I think it's a much better way to translate it. So for many people, religion and even views of spirituality actually handed them a whole checklist of perfection that just has made them so miserable. Think of how many addictions, think of how many ways that we find ourselves stuck in bad patterns come from you're supposed to get it all right the first time. So here's the deal. You don't have to get it right the first time. What you do in Tove is you simply learn. You fall flat on your face, you get up, and then you ask yourself a bunch of questions about what you can learn because you're discovering because thank God you don't know it all. Whew, it'd be so boring. Good versus perfect. My brothers and sisters, welcome to good.